Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to the only channel on YouTube about RVs and RVing. Well, it's the only channel I know of that gives you a former campground owner and lifelong RVers perspective and view on the RV lifestyle and of the RV industry. Whether it's good news or bad news, I try and be the best wingman possible by telling you the truth. I do. And by finding guests that I trust, guests that I think that you might want to listen to. And that's definitely the case today as we wrap up the two-part interview with Ron Burge, an RV lemon lawyer. And we discuss what a California judge calls a, they call it a scheme, by one of the biggest RV manufacturers in the nation. Now, that is a bold statement, I know, but it's what the judge is saying about Thor. If you missed part one of my interview, a link to it is up above and in the description down below. Let's get started. Are we to maybe, maybe I'm being overly optimistic here, to assume that the judge ruling in favor of the RV owner, the plaintiff here, is a step in the right direction, might might start leading to more things, not going to Indiana, but going to the state, you know, the specific state where the RV was purchased? I think that it might well, once the word gets around that there have been two federal judges now in different courts in California, both of whom have called this thing a, a scheme that Thor is using. And when you see what's happening, it's essentially to deprive the rights of California RV purchasers of their California law so that they lose without even knowing that they're losing. And the, I think the people judge, are going to wise up out there. The judge literally yeah. called it a scheme. Literally. A sc both, both judges used that word. They called the Thor warranty a scheme. Both of them did. When you think, okay, well, what's the idea behind this whole scheme? Well, the only reason for it is because they've known for years that these clauses, the jury waiver, and also you got to use Indiana law and sue us in Indiana, that those are not enforceable. And yet Thor keeps doing it. Well, why would they keep doing it? Well, the only reason they would keep doing it is because there's something coming out of it that favors them that they like. They decide, in other words, not to follow that law. Question, are the, the judges in Indiana you know, I know that this is the conspiracy part of me, but are the judges in Indiana pretty tight with the RV manufacturers? You know, like the attorney general, for example, hey, here's some money for your, uh, you know, re-election campaign. I mean, are they chummy chummy? Uh, again, that may be just a conspiracy theory, but it would seem like to me, that knowing if I was a manufacturer, I'd want to know the people that were in charge. They may get tickets to go to a basketball game for me, just to, just to kind of build favor. I wouldn't say that they're chummy chummy. Uh, what you've got is a situation where you have federal judges and you also have state judges. In federal court, those judges are appointed for life. Once they get that job, they got that job pretty much as long as they want it, as long as they can do the job. So there's no reason for them to be biased because they're, they're going to be there regardless of who wins and who loses on a case. State court judges, somewhat different. Uh, as far as elected officials go, well, that's when you turn to the lobbying arm of the RVIA and the industry and the others that are out there. They, they certainly do their best to make sure that the state and federal government understand that exactly what their business is about and how it contributes to taxes and everything. And you got to remember that in Indiana, the RV industry is huge in terms yeah. of employment and payroll and taxes and everything else. And on a national basis, the RV industry and the effects of it are huge as well. And they make sure the federal Congress knows all about that. So for the people who scored a somewhat victory, if you will, the plaintiff in California, they still have to go to court. They still, they're still going to get a jury trial. They still have to go through the whole legal process. It's just the people that are going to be hearing this are their peers and not somebody in a state that's more than a thousand miles away. Right. And who might even be working for the manufacturer for all they know, or else working for the industry that supplies parts to the RV industry. You know, that, that may well be the case. They do still have to go to court. But, you know, that, that brings up another interesting thing. I did a lot of research on this whole thing when I started to see it happening. And I looked at the cases that were being transferred to Indiana out of California. Most of them seem to settle either before they even get to the courthouse in Indiana or shortly afterwards or somewhere along the way, they don't go to trial. And I think that part of the logic that may be behind all of this from the 
factories into the process is that if you have to travel a couple of thousand miles to get to a courthouse, you're going to have less interest in actually fighting all the way through to get to the courthouse. You're going to have more interest in uh, the idea of let's get it over with. I need to go on with my life. Now, on the other hand, if you're in California and you have defeated their motion and now you're going to be in a California courtroom with California law, well, that's just a matter of driving downtown or driving from where you live to that nearest courthouse. And then it's a whole different ballgame of convenience. That kind of goes back to what I, I've said before about when you buy an RV, you want to buy it from someplace near you because when you got a problem, you can go in the door and sit there and complain. It's not so easy when you got to go all the way across the country to get anything done and get some attention. Okay, a couple of things. One, uh, you have said to me in the past, I believe, I'm paraphrasing, that a consumer might be better off if there was no warranty at all on the new oh, yeah. RV purchased. And, and I'd Absolutely. like you to explain that, explain what that means. And I wonder if I, as a consumer right now, if I go to the dealer and they say, well, sign here, you know what? I don't want that warranty. And you cross it through, not accepted initially. I'm, I don't even know if that's something that you could do, but what would be the, the effect of not having a warranty? If you buy a product, a consumer product, and you don't get a warranty from the manufacturer, then if the manufacturer is in a couple of states, specifically Indiana, for instance, you automatically get an implied warranty of merchantability and fitness for use. You can get both of those just because the law says you should have that. On the other hand, you get that same warranty from the seller of the goods in most states. But that's if the warranty that this, if the warranty language in the seller's sales contract doesn't deny it because they can say, no, we're not giving that to you in your sales paperwork. But the manufacturer in Indiana, for instance, they can't get away with that. They automatically have to give you that implied warranty. Now, what that means, implied warranty of merchantability, it means essentially the product is safe and it's going to do what it's supposed to do. Now, there's some fuzziness around all of those sorts of words that apply. But what it means is that you actually end up with the right to sue the manufacturer over whatever's wrong with the RV, as opposed to all the clauses that they have in their warranty that says you got to do this, you got to give us a final repair, you got to give us a written notice, and you got to mail it to this address, and you have to use Indiana law. You can't sue us in California, you can't sue us in Oregon, and any of the other places you might be living and where you bought it. In other words, all that stuff kind of goes out the window because the implied warranty of merchantability locks in and it gives you broader legal rights than but, but the warranty, warranties. The warranty that I get when I buy a new RV sounds like, in a sense, it's sort of a shield, like a like a magic trick, like to make me think that, oh, they got all this coverage. We, you wouldn't want to not have a warranty, not telling you that they you have this implied warranty that you just described. So, okay, the, the, the second thing I want to find out before I let you go is what's the takeaway for other RV owners. If I lived in North Carolina or Texas, wherever, not just California, how does this affect me? What's the takeaway here? Well, no matter what kind of an RV, if you're buying an RV new, you need to take a look at that warranty before you ever sign on the dotted line so that you got some idea of what they're doing in their legal rights on their end, as well as what's happening on your end if you buy that RV. And don't always believe everything that that warranty says. It may say that you have to do this, that, or the other. That may not be true. Okay. If, when push comes to shove, you need to get a lawyer on your side, frankly, to find out for sure what you can do and not just believe it because they said it. Now, there is one other angle on this too. You mentioned class action a, long, a little while ago, and I mentioned mm -hmm. that typically that's really hard to do with an RV company. But think about this particular circumstance. You've got an RV company, Thor, doing the exact same thing, which is telling people in California in their warranties, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And you don't get a jury right and all of that. And Thor knows it's not true. And you have a lot of people being affected the same way by that little tricky mm. maneuver, so to speak. That sounds like a class action waiting to happen. Just for the people in California though, because the laws in, in Georgia or Florida may be different. They are different. But for exactly California, right. there's a lot of RV owners out there in California that, that if they were aware of this, they could probably, 
you know, join this class action maneuver, whatever. I'm not suggesting that. I was just kind of poking around. So um, it's possible out there, but you're absolutely right. You know, that may not be the case for that particular issue in Georgia, in Atlanta, in Ohio, in Tennessee, in, in Milwaukee, wherever. You got to look at the state law and what that warranty's terms are doing to you in your state. So I'm going to go back to that question, the thing, the thought that I had about when I'm buying the new RV and going through the paperwork, I just take a Sharpie and just cross through the warranty, you know, refused, refused and initial it. Could I do that? Or is that, I mean, do people do it? Is it up to the dealer to say, I'll still take your money, no warranty, good. Is, would that, <laughs> dealers would probably be mad at me for, for even bringing the subject up, but is that something that they could do if they wanted? You could, but I wouldn't suggest it just yet because you need to make sure that you're getting that implied warranty from the seller of the goods too. Frankly, that's the best place to get it because that's where you're going to go back if you got a problem. But so I thought, it still I thought, goes back to those magic words that you need to write on the sales contract that the dealer warrants the RV for three days. But I thought what you said was even without a warranty, there's an implied warranty. Without the warranty that I sign and, and accept, there's an implied warranty. So it, it would meet the way I'm thinking. I'd say, hey, I don't want the factory warranty. I'll take your implied warranty. That's not there. It's not spelled out. I'm probably confusing people. I don't maybe confusing you. Yeah, no, here's, here's where, the, where the rub is. That implied warranty, so to speak, comes automatically in Indiana law. But if you, if you buy your RV in, say, Tennessee, and you don't get that factory warranty, that factory warranty is what says that you have Indiana law. So instead, now you want to sue them under Tennessee law. Well, you need to make sure that Tennessee law says that the manufacturer is going to be liable on that implied warranty too, and not uh, just the dealer. Otherwise, you could be saying, I don't want that factory warranty because it's got too many hoops I have to jump through to get anything in life. You may be giving away that implied warranty that automatically Indiana manufacturers are required to give. You got to be careful about all that. You got to remember, there's 101 ways to take the money away. You got to find the ways that you can keep the money in your pocket. Ron, it's, I just hate having to talk to you about things like this. It shouldn't be that difficult, but I got to tell you, yeah. it would seem like to me, business is pretty good for the Burge Law Firm. I mean, you have no shortage of customers. We have, we have a lot of cases, that's very true. And a lot of RV cases with RV manufacturers of all types. And you're right, it, it shouldn't be that tough. When you go to buy an RV, you ha you should have the right to expect that the dealer who sells it and takes your money is going to stand behind it, not run away from you when you come in the door with a problem. And you should have a right to expect that the manufacturer is going to stand behind what they build and not just simply say, well, that's somebody else's problem because we don't cover that part of the RV. I'll tell you what, visiting with Ron Burge is always enlightening. It's not always a pleasant conversation for sure, but an important conversation to have. At least I think it is. That said, there are many people on the RV manufacturer side who do not appreciate these kinds of interviews and for good reason. So here's my question for you. Do you find these occasional visits about the law and how it pertains to RVs to be of interest? Do you? Or are they just plain boring? If you like these occasional visits to get an expert's perspective Type one in the comments below. If you think these RV lemon lawyer interviews are simply a waste of time and too boring, type two. Either way, let us know which way you're leaning. Thanks to Ron Burge, whose contact info is down below. And thank you for watching. I do hope you'll hit the subscribe button and turn your notifications on. Until next time, be safe, have fun, play nice, and don't leave your good manners at home. Adios from the wingman.